Hello, my name is Dr. Ralph Hughes, and in this video lecture, I discuss how leaders set the tone of the organization, the tone that's also conducive for group dynamics and group behavior. We can draw several implications about behavior, group dynamics in particular. Norms control behavior by establishing standards of right and wrong. The status inequities create frustration and can adversely influence productivity and willingness to remain within an organization. The impact of size on a group's performance depends on the type of task. Cohesiveness may influence a group's level of productivity depending on the group's performance related norms. Diversity appears to have a mixed impact on group performance, with some studies suggesting that diversity can help performance, and others suggesting the opposite. Role conflict is associated with job-induced tension and job dissatisfaction. Groups can be carefully managed toward positive organizational outcomes and optimal decision-making. Recognize that groups can have a dramatic impact on individual behavior in organizations to either positive or negative effect. Special attention must be made to roles, norms, and cohesion to understand how these are operating within a group and to understand how the group is likely to behave. To decrease the possibility of deviant workplace activities, Ensure that group norms do not support antisocial behavior. This is primarily important for managers of organizations to understand. Managers must also understand that they have to pay attention to the status aspects of the group. Because lower status people tend to participate less in group discussions, groups with high status differences are likely to inhibit input from lower status members and reduce their potential. Use larger groups for fact-finding activities and smaller groups for action-taking tasks. With larger groups, provide measures of individual performance. To increase employee satisfaction, make certain people perceive the job roles accurately. One point is this. You've heard the adage of birds of a feather flock together, but when it comes to business, it may be better for pigeons to flock with crooks. Crows. Employees may feel more comfortable working with people who are similar, similar to them, but this comfort may come at a cost of success. Time after time, research demonstrates that more diverse companies have the most success. That's why it's primarily important to have diverse, diverse organizations, diverse groups. A global analysis of 2,400 companies demonstrated that the presence of at least one female employee on an executive board leads to higher net income growth and return on equity. Diversity at lower levels of the organization may also be helpful. Companies with more diverse work groups have higher financial returns than companies with fewer minority or female employees. Diverse group think smarter. When people are tasked to work with people who are different from them, they are forced out of their comfort zone, leading to more critical thinking and innovation. For example, in mock juries, more ethically, ethnically heterogeneous juries make more accurate decisions and supported their decisions with more facts from the case. Teams of heterogeneous financial professions also perform better on tasks where they were asked to price stocks in a stock market simulation. In addition, a recent analysis of research and design teams in Spain found that teams with greater gender diversity created more innovative products. Other types of diversity may also be beneficial. In a murder mystery task, groups with a mix of organizational tenure were more likely to guess the correct sus suspect. When cultural diversity of businesses in the UK were analyzed, more culturally diverse leadership teams created more new products. So the next time you're worried about working with someone you don't have a lot in common with, remember the words of Maya Angelou, in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. This is pivotal for leaders of organizations.
is pivotal simply because the leaders create the tone in the organization. They're responsible for ensuring a cohesive and congenial work environment. Without leaders demonstrating this themselves, they fall victim. Victim that they cannot produce an organization that appreciates diversity. When all members of the organization feels that they are a part of something much higher than themselves and that they appreciate going to work because of the way that they are treated, especially because of their ethnicity. This too brings about success within the organization. So leaders in organizations, they serve at the, as the central figure to really create the organizations, the tone of the organization, where everyone feels respected, where everyone feels that they have a voice, where everyone feels that they can bring about them their best self to every task on a daily basis. This is truly the mark of a good leader. One who can create that tone, create that environment of inclusiveness for all employees. Hello. I'm Dr. Ralph Hughes. In this video lecture, I discuss transactional leadership and how it is my opinion that transactional leadership is not in fact a leadership theory. It is listed as a leadership theory, but I espouse that it's not a leadership theory. Before I expound on a notion, let's look a little bit at leadership. Leadership is defined as a process. It's an individual who align followers to accomplish a common goal, accomplish a common organizational goal. A leader is one who is mission-driven to bring the envisioned future into existence. The purpose of a leader is to fulfill the organizational mission. That is truly the purpose of a leader, to fulfill the organizational mission. How does a leader do this? Well, the leader, leader accomplishes this by having the knowledge of behavioral science. Behavioral science, organizational behavior. Leaders know that it is in fact a social science. There are other characteristics that are inherent to leadership, and leaders know that they have to align people. If they cannot align people, if they cannot attract people to do the job, then they simply cannot lead. They align people by using the language of leadership, descriptive language, being authentic, being ethical, etc. The leaders, they create a culture, an atmosphere conducive for employees to want to work and be their absolute best. So again, when we look at leaders, there are some characteristics we must look at. We must look at in addition to being ethical. What about humility? Leaders must be humble. Leaders must have human skills. They must be empathetic. They have to ha have the understanding of emotional intelligence. They have to have high values. They have to be able to inspire others. They have to be able to empower employees. They do take risks. They are visionaries. They also include everyone in the organization. They truly include everyone in the organization because the leaders understand that it is not about them. It is truly about the mission. Leaders also, they build teams, they embrace risk, they help others grow, they demand the very best of employees, they influence others, they set examples, they mentor, they coach, 
they're proactive, they're innovative, they're revo they revolutionize, they're revolutionaries, they plan. These are the essential characteristics of leaders. Now, to accomplish the organizational goals, the leaders use certain tools. One tool is simply the leadership style or the leadership theory. The leader uses this tool to accomplish, once again, the organizational goals. There are certain leadership styles and theories such as transforma uh, transformational leadership, servant leadership, but I want to concentrate on transactional leadership. Transactional leadership is defined as it empowers individuals or the lack thereof. Transactional leadership does not empower employees. It really attempts to appeal to follow a self-interest by creating an exchange relationship. It attempts to influence others by exchanging, for example, work for wages. This type of leadership doesn't create or inspire innovation. It doesn't inspire creativity. It doesn't inspire anyone to be motivated other than self grandizing purposes. What I mean by that is very simple. If I give you a bonus for doing your job, that may inspire some motivation in others to perform at a certain level. If I give you an award for simply doing your job, they may inspire individuals to continue to do the job. So transactional leadership really is what it says in terms of transactional. It's a transaction. It's quid pro quo. You give me something, I give you something in return. Well, you are getting something in return for your work, which is pay. You're paid for a job that you perform on a daily basis. I shouldn't give you now or award you with a bonus for you simply doing your job. If you go above and beyond, yeah, it's possible that you should receive a bonus. But again, looking at the transactional approach, I want to use that bonus as a carrot stick that I will dangle in front of your face. So that way, you will become more inclined to stay in the office longer hours, um, produce more work, so that way you can get a bonus. That is the motivational factor behind transactional leadership. And it should be called transactional management um, because everything we know about leadership is good. Um, I, we talked about the characteristics and the traits of a leader and everything that the leader does for the most part doesn't really have that transactional characteristic in terms of that quid pro quo, you give me something, I give you something in return, like dangling a carrot in front of you is what I'm referring to in this context. Really, how a transactional approach would be from a, a leader would be if you're doing your job and you do your job well, so you're not just simply doing your job, you're going above and beyond. You're going above and beyond for no other reason, simply because you want to do a great job and the leader recognizes that. So what the leader does is the leader commends you for doing a great job. The leader commends you for going above and beyond the call of duty. That I can see, but simply giving someone a bonus or giving someone an award simply for them to perform a task that they're already getting paid to perform and their actions, their activities, their work production is not above and beyond, then that is simply transactional and it's transactional in nature and that's a management approach. Um, and 
I see this happens is most prevalent in government organizations where the award system is truly based on the transactional approach. And we have to really look at how we can inspire employees in our organizations um, to become motivated, inspire that motivation within employees to really not look for a bonus, not look for an award, but truly what they can bring to the table to make that organization the very, very best. So a good sign of a leader is not how many followers you have, but how many leaders you create. A leader should be able to create that environment. By creating that environment, you won't have a transactional environment. What you will have is a, le a, a, a culture of leaders, leaders, a culture of leaders. And when you have a culture of leaders, it only can make your organization flourish. Hello, I'm Dr. Ralph Hughes. And in this video lecture, I discuss communication and how important it is for leaders to have effective communication. But first, we're gonna talk about communication as a whole. Communication serves the five major functions within a group or organization, management, feedback, emotional sharing, persuasion, and information exchange. The communication acts to manage member behavior in several ways. Organizations have authority, hierarchies, hierarchies and formal guidelines employees are required to follow. When employees follow their job descriptions or comply with company policies, communication performs a management function. Informal communication controls behavior too. When work groups tease or harass a member who produces too much and makes the rest of the members look bad, they are informally communicating and managing the member's behavior. So communication creates feedback by clarifying to employees what they must do, how well they are doing it, and how they can improve their performance. The work group is a primary source of social interaction for many employees. Communication within the group is a fundamental mechanism by which members show satisfaction and frustration. Communication, therefore, provides for the emotional sharing of feelings and fulfillment of social needs. For example, after a white police officer shot an unarmed black man in Ferguson, Missouri in 2015, software engineer Carl Jones wanted to process his feelings through talking with his co-workers at his corporation. As a second example, Starbucks had baristas write race together on coffee cups to start conversations about race relations. In both cases, the initial communications were awkward, so awkward that Starbucks pulled the campaign. But Jones and others have forged solid relationships from their emotional sharing. Like emotional sharing, persuasion can be good or bad, depending on if, say, a leader is trying to persuade a work group to believe in the organization's commitment to corporate social responsibility, or to conversely persuade the group to break the law to meet an organizational goal. These may be extreme examples, but it's important to remember that persuasion can benefit or harm an organization. The final function of communication is information exchange to facilitate decision making. Communication provides the information individuals and groups need to make decisions by transmitting the data needed to identify and evaluate choices. Almost every communication interaction that takes place in a group or organization performs one or more of these functions. And none of the five is more important than the other. To perform effectively, groups need to maintain some control over members, provide feedback to stimulate the members to perform, allow emotional expression, monitor the persuasive ex efforts of individuals, and encourage information exchange. Before communication can take place, it needs a purpose, a message to be conveyed between a sender and a receiver. See, the sender encodes the message and passes it through a medium to the receiver who decodes it. The result is a transfer of meaning from one person to another. And that's why it's primarily important for leaders 
to send the right message to their employees at all times. This is another example of that. The leader is the sender and the employees are the receivers of information. So it's something I, I talk about and is referred to as a language of leadership. The language of leadership is a compelling vision that leaders share verbally with his adherents. How the leader elicits buy-in from all employees of the organization to ensure that the goal is attained. So is that the characteristics and the traits, the feelings that leaders come to the table with and they use those characteristics, they use those traits and those abilities to share their meaning, their purpose with their employees. And how they do that is by creating that atmosphere, by speaking, by the, the vocal, the vocal component of leadership and how the vocalizers are stressed within the, the leader to stress upon the employees the importance of achieving that vision or goal for the organization. It is how, in other words, the leader speaks to employees to elicit this buy-in. And it's extremely important for leaders to be able to do that in such a way that employees will not take offense. Leaders have to be the architects of effective communication. Leaders cannot lead effectively if they cannot communicate effectively. So communication that flows from one level of a group or organization to a lower level is referred to as downward communication. Group leaders and managers use it to assign goals, provide job instructions, explain policies and procedures, and point out problems that need attention and other feedback. In downward communication, managers must explain the reasons why a decision was made. Also, this may seem like common sense. Many managers feel they are too busy to explain things or that explanations will raise too many questions. Another problem in downward communication is its one-way nature. Generally, managers inform employees but rarely solicit their advice or opinions. Research revealed that nearly two-thirds of employees said their bosses really or never asked their advice. The study noted organizations are always striving for higher employee engagement, but evidence indicates they unnecessarily create fundamental mistakes. People need to be respected and listened to. The way advice is solicited also matters. Employees will not provide input even when conditions are favorable if doing so seems against their best interests. In downward communication, the delivery mode and the context of the information exchange are of high importance. But in upward communication, it flows to a higher level in the group or organization. It is used to provide feedback to higher ups, inform them of progress toward goals, and relay current problems. Upward communication keeps managers aware of how employees feel about their jobs, coworkers, and the organization in general. Managers also rely on upward communication for ideas on how conditions can be improved. Given that most managers' job responsibilities have expanded, upward communication is increasingly difficult because managers can be overwhelmed and easily distracted. To engage in effective upward communication, try to communicate in short summaries rather than long explanations. Support your summaries with actionable items and prepare an agenda to make sure you use your boss's attention well. And watch what you say, especially if you are communicating something to your manager that will be unwelcome. If you're turning down an assignment, for example, be sure to project 
a can-do attitude while asking advice about your workload dilemma on experience excuse me in experience with the assignment your delivery can be as important as the content of your communication so this is very true when it comes to communication not only from the leader to the employees but also from employees to leaders as well so we also look at what is referred to as lateral communication when communication occurs between members of the same work group members at the same level in separate work groups or any other horizontally equivalent workers uh, we describe it as a lateral communication lateral communication saves time and facilitates co coordination some lateral relationships are formally sanctioned more often they are informally created to short circuit the vertical hierarchy and expedite action the formal small group networks uh, can be complicated, including hundreds of people and a half dozen or more hierarchical levels. The, and there are different types of uh, dynamics when it comes to communication in relation to the leader and employees. So essentially, the link between communication and employee satisfaction is extremely important it's extremely important and it is important for leaders to truly be able to speak convincingly and compelling to employees to make sure that the organization is in harmony that each and every member of the organization is in harmony with one another and that they can get the job done harmoniously and that the environment the tone of the organization is amenable to group behavior and dynamics and harmony and just to make sure that all members of the group they understand the goal of the organization the mission of the organization and is how that leader shares the vision through effective communication will determine the success of the organization. Hello, I'm Dr. Ralph Hughes. And in this video lecture, I discuss transformational leadership and how leaders elicit buy-in from employees during a change initiative. Transformational leaders empower individuals at all organizational levels to assume leadership roles. Transformational leaders encourages, empowers, and motivates employees to be their very best. Transformational leadership is a process whereby a person engages with others and creates a connection that raises the level of motivation and morality in both the leader and the follower. This type of leader is attentive to the needs and motives of followers and tries to help followers reach their fullest potential. Therefore, transformational leaders, they raise motivation within the follower, not only the follower, but the leader him or herself. This engenders a higher level of performance Transformational leaders believe that if they encourage and motivate and empower employees to be their very best, that these individuals will be the leaders of the organization tomorrow. Characteristics of transformational leaders are inspirational, they are charismatic, motivational, they formulate decisions that benefit the group and they provide meaningful and challenging work. When discussing transformational leadership, there are four factors. Idolized influence, intellectual stimulation, individualized consideration, and inspirational motivation. Idolized influence is also called charisma. 
It describes leaders who act as strong role models for followers. Followers identify with these leaders and want very much to emulate them. These leaders usually have very high standards of moral and ethical conduct and can be counted on to do the right thing. They are deeply respected by followers who usually place a great deal of trust in them. They provide followers with a vision and sense of mission. Inspirational motivation. This factor is descriptive of leaders who communicate high expectations to followers inspiring them through motivation to become committed to and a part of the sheer vision in the organization. In practice, leaders use symbols and emotional appeals to focus group members' efforts to achieve more than they would in their own self-interest. Team spirit is enhanced by this type of leadership. Intellectual stimulation. It includes leadership that stimulates followers to be creative and innovative and to challenge their own beliefs and values as well as those of the leader and the organization. This type of leader supports followers as they try new approaches and develop innovative ways of dealing with organizational issues. It encourages followers to think things out on their own and engage in careful problem solving. Individualized consideration. This factor representative of leaders who provide a supportive climate in which they listen carefully to the individual needs of followers. Leaders act as coaches and advisors while trying to assist in followers becoming fully actualized. These leaders may use delegation to help followers grow through personal challenges. So what is the application? How do we apply transformational leadership? Again, transformational leadership is mostly concerned with how leaders empower others to get on board with the sheer vision, to attain the organizational goal at hand. Usually transformational leaderships, like transformational leadership is best applied when there is a need for some sort of change. When there's a change process that is inevitable. For example, I worked for a government organization that decided that they wanted to be paperless, not to have any type of paper whatsoever. So everything in terms of the documents, folders would be non-existent. What will replace that would be all electronic databases and electronic files. What the chief did, what the leader did in this organization was elicit buy-in from all organizational members, from the clerk all the way up to assistant deputies. And it was pivotal, pivotal in this change initiative simply because they realized, the chief realized, I should say, that in order to fully have change realized in this organization from the standpoint of being fully paperless, he knew that he had to get everyone on board with his mission. So he explained his mission, he talked about his mission, he talked about his vision, and that the pros and the benefits of the organization by ensuring that we become paperless. So he let everyone know every step of the way. So the rollout process is extremely important when you're undergoing a change initiative. You have to ensure that all the members are fully aware of the change initiative, they understand the change initiative, and that they are not resistant to change. Some people do not want change. They believe that what is working, if it is in fact working, it doesn't need to change. So let things be 
and continue as they have. But it takes a visionary to determine that there is a need for change and that change is inevitable. And when you see those particular items where change has to manifest itself and ha change has to take root and cause, then it is truly up to the leader to explain that change process and apply that change process. So the transformational approach to leadership is a broad-based perspective that encompasses many facets and dimensions of the leadership process. It describes leaders and how leaders can initiate, develop, and carry out significant changes in organizations, like I just explained in my example. Although not definitive, the steps followed by transformational leaders usually take on the following forms, such as transformational leaders set out to empower followers and nurture them in that change process. They attempt to raise the consciousness in individuals and get them to transcend their own self-interest for the sake of others. To create change, transformational leaders become strong role models for their followers. They have a highly developed set of moral values and a self-determined sense of identity. They are confident, competent, and articulate, and they express strong ideals. They listen to followers and, not are, and are not intolerant of opposing viewpoints. It is common for transformational leaders to create a vision. The vision emerges from the collective interests of various individuals and units in an organization. The vision is a focal point of transformational leadership. It gives the leader and the organization a conceptual map for where the organization is headed. The transformational approach also requires that leaders become social architects. This means that they make clear the emerging values and norms of the organization. They involve themselves in the culture of the organization and help shape its meaning. People need to know their roles and understand how they contribute to the greater purpose of the organization. Transformational leaders are out front in interpreting and shaping the organization. They shared meaning and that exists within them.